Letter 27 My dear father, your letter has filled me with joy that I can poorly express by my pen. It assures me that you are certain to leave at the new moon and after a few days delay at Gaza that you will be with me not many days afterward. This letter I shall send to meet you at Gaza. In it I shall make known to you the particulars of the greatest miracle of power and love above all those wonders which Jesus has done. When Mary and Martha had dispatched the message to Jesus, as I have already stated, they began to be more cheerful with newborn hope, saying, If our dear rabbi, the holy prophet, comes, he will heal him with the word as he has done so many of the sick. Yes, many whom he knew not he has restored to health by a touch, remarked Martha. How much more Lazarus, whom he loves as a brother! Oh, that the messenger may press forward with all haste! If Lazarus should die ere he come, hesitatingly remarked my gentle cousin, the wife of John the disciple, he could bring him to life again, even as he did the son of the widow of Nain. Yes, without doubt, unless it were too late, remarked Martha, shrinking at the thought that her brother should die. But if he be long dead, it will be impossible. Nothing is impossible with Jesus, answered Mary, her eyes brightening with trusting faith. Thus the hours passed between mingled hopes and fears, but ere Jesus came, lo, the mantle of death was laid over the face of their dead brother. Lazarus is dead and Jesus is far away, was the bitter and touching cry made by the bereaved sisters as they wept in each other's arms. The next day the burial took place, and yet no messenger came from Jesus. The morning of the third day the man returned and said that he had found the prophet on the farther bank of Jordan, where John had baptized, abiding in a humble cottage in the suburbs of Bethabara with his disciples. The bearer of the sad tidings from the two sisters delivered his simple and touching message. Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And what said he? How did his countenance appear? Asked Martha of the man. He betrayed no surprise, but said calmly to me, Son, I know it. This sickness shall not be unto death. It shall be for the glory of God. For hereby will my Father permit me to be glorified, that men may see and believe truly that I came out from God. Alas, he knew not how ill his friend was, said Mary, or he would not have said it was not unto death, and would surely have hastened with you. He has forgotten us, answered Martha. He should be here to console us in our deep affliction, though he came not to heal our brother. Nay, sister, do not think hardly of the blessed friend of Lazarus, said Mary with soothing tones as she caressed her elder sister. I feel that if he had seen fit, he could have raised up our brother, even speaking the word from Bethabara. It was not needful he should see him to heal him, for dost thou remember how he healed Lucius, the centurion's son? Yet at the time he was a day's journey distant from him. Then why, oh why, did he not save Lazarus? exclaimed Martha bitterly. In that he did not, sweet sister, answered Mary gently. It was for the best. Did he not say to the messenger his sickness should be to the glory of his power? But not his death, Mary, not his death. He is dead four days already, and how can the grave give glory to the power of Jesus? Will he raise him up since corruption hath begun, nay, begun, ere we laid him in the cold sepulchre? Oh, speak not to me of the prophet, he loved not Lazarus, or he had not the power to save him. Nay, leave me, Mary, to the bitterness of my grief. Ah, dear Martha, how soon is thy faith in Jesus when tried become not? Said Mary, bending upon her, from her dark, earnest eyes, looks of sad reproach. Shall one day overturn your years of holy friendship for him? Because he answered not our prayer to come to Lazarus, think you he loved him not and is indifferent to our anguish? He is wronged by your reproof and injured by your want of confidence in his love and care for us. While they were thus discoursing, one came running swiftly towards the house, and breathless with haste, cried to them and to the Jews sitting there who had come to comfort them concerning their brother, The prophet, the Nazarene, he comes! Almost at the same moment, Elik the Gibeonite entered and said, Jesus, Messiah of God, is at hand. He already entereth the village followed by his disciples. At this intelligence, the mourners who sat with Mary and Martha in the vine porch rose up to go and meet him, 
But Martha, shrieking with a reaction of sudden joy, sprang up, and more quickly than they, reached the street, and flying with great speed, came where Jesus was. Mary, who had received the news without betraying any other emotion than the secret and holy joy of a heart that had confidence all along in her Lord, instead of hastening to meet him, rending her hair with grief like her sister, proceeded to prepare a room for the hospitable entertainment of the beloved prophet when he should come in, thus taking Martha's usual place. And when she had arranged all, she sat down with me in the house, her heart filled with joy and her face expressive of calm and quiet happiness. When Martha had come near Jesus, whom she met just entering Bethany, walking with four of his disciples along the dusty road and looking weary and travel-worn, she ran and threw herself at his feet, crying, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Jesus, taking her hand, raised her up and said with emotion, for he seemed deeply moved by her grief, Death to those whom my father loveth is sleep. The good die not. Lazarus is not dead, but sleepeth and he shall rise again. I know, O Rabbani, that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus then said to her, lifting his celestial glances towards heaven, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this, daughter? Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I know that whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee, and that even now thou couldst bring Lazarus back again. Corruption and the worm have begun their work, said a proud and unbelieving Pharisee near on hearing this. Whatever may have been the state of the ruler's daughter and of the son of her of Nain, Lazarus the scribe at least is dead. To this speech Jesus made no reply, but turning to Martha said softly, this day my father shall be glorified, and the world shall truly know that I am come from him who is life and the giver of life. Go thou and tell thy sister that I am here and would have her come and speak with me. Martha then overjoyed and wondering that Jesus should have known her thoughts so as to reproach her for her little faith as he had done, hastened to her sister and entering cried, I have seen the Lord. He calleth for thee, Mary. Come and see him as he sits by Isaiah's fountain near the marketplace. Mary rose quickly and went out. Certain of her Jewish friends from Jerusalem at that moment met her at the door and began to comfort her and to ask her if they also should go with her to weep at the grave of Lazarus, for they said to one another, She goes unto the grave to weep there. She goes to see Jesus, the friend of Lazarus, for he calleth her, answered Martha, smiling with eagerness and speaking with an animation that presented a singular contrast to her late deep grief. Mary hastened to where Jesus sat by the fountain, bathing his dusty and wounded feet. Lord, she said in her sister's words and with deep emotion, if thou, Lord, hadst been here, my brother had not died. Then, bowing her head to the edge of the marble basin, she wept very heavily. The Jews, men and women who stood about, being touched with her sorrow, also wept, while glittering tears coursed their way down the face of the beloved John, his disciple who stood near. Jesus sighed deeply and groaned in spirit as he beheld her grief and their mourning with her. His sacred countenance was marred with the anguish of his soul. Rise, let us go to the grave where he lieth. He said to them, Where have ye laid him? Come, dear Lord, and see, answered Mary, holding him reverently by the sleeve of the robe, and gently yet eagerly drawing him towards the place of the tombs in the Vale of Olivet. In the meanwhile, at home, Martha had been diligently, and with strange cheerfulness, getting in readiness the room of Lazarus. She swept and dusted it and garnished it with fresh flowers, which she gathered in the little garden. This is the rose he set out and loved. This is the violet which blooms immortal. I will place it upon his pillow. She said with a joyous hilarity softened by the most lovely look of peace, while hope shone in her eyes, like twin morning stars ushering in a glorious day. She spoke scarcely above her breath and moved on tiptoe. For whom is this preparation, dearest Martha? For Jesus? I asked. Oh no, the holy prophet's own room is ready. Mary has prepared that. This is Lazarus's room, and I am decorating it for him. Dost thou truly believe that he is coming back from the dead? I asked between doubt and strange fear. Believe? Oh yes, I know that nothing is impossible with Jesus. 
I doubt no more. My faith trembles no longer. He will raise up my brother, and this day he shall sit down at our table with us again, and this night rest his head in peaceful slumber upon this pillow which I am strewing with his favorite flowers. Never had house two such guests as we shall have this day, the Messiah of God, and one come back alive from the dead. At this moment we heard the noise of the multitude passing by, and it being told us that Jesus was going to the grave, Martha, embracing me with a heavenly smile, drew me gently after her to follow the blessed prophet to the tomb. All Bethany was in his footsteps. How shall I describe Jesus as he then appeared? He wore a blue robe, woven without seam throughout, the affectionate work and gift of the two sisters. His face was very pale and sad, yet a certain divine majesty rested thereon, so that his calm, high forehead looked as if it were a throne. His holy, earnest eyes were full of sorrow. His mouth, compressed, betrayed the effort he made to suppress the outbursting of his heart's deep grief. Slowly, he moved onward, and entering the cemetery, he soon stood before the tomb of his beloved friend. For a few moments, he stood gazing upon the closed stone door of the cave in silence. There reigned an expectant hush among the vast throng. Mary knelt at his feet, gazing up into his countenance with a sublime expression of hope and trust. Martha drew softly near and fell upon her knees by the side of her sister. Jesus looked tenderly upon them, and resting his eyes upon the tomb, wept. Large, glittering tears rolled down his cheeks and glanced from his flowing beard to the ground. I knelt by the side of the sisters. Behold how he loved him, whispered the Jews present with surprise. Others said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, heaving a deep sigh, now came nearer the grave. With a slight movement of his right hand to those who stood by, he said in a tone that, though low, was heard by the whole people, so solemn was the surrounding stillness. Take ye away the stone. Lord, said Martha, by this time the body is offensive, for he hath been dead four days. Daughter, said Jesus, looking on her, believe, and thou shalt behold the power of God. The men then, with some difficulty, took away the stone from the door of the sepulchre and stood upon one side. The dark vault yawned with gloomy horrors, and so corrupt was the air that rushed out, all fell back from it, save Jesus and Mary, retiring several steps from the entrance. Jesus stood looking into the cave, where, as our eyes became accustomed to the darkness within, we could discern the corpse of Lazarus covered with the grave mantle, and his face bound with a napkin, which was already discolored with the sepulchral damp of the grave. Raising his hands toward heaven, and lifting up his spiritual eyes, which were yet moist with tears, Jesus spoke in a voice of indescribable pathos and earnestness of appeal, and with a manner of the most awful reverence, as follows, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, do I offer unto thee this prayer, that they may believe that the power I have cometh from thee, and that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And now, O Holy Father, may I glorify thee on the earth with the power which thou hast given me. He then turned towards the tomb, and stretching forth his hand, he cried with a loud voice that made every heart quake, Lazarus, come forth! My blood stood still in my veins. Scarcely daring to behold, I looked and beheld what all eyes also saw. The corpse rise and stand up within the vault, turn round with its face towards us, and come forth, wrapped hand and foot with the grave clothes, and his face bound about with a napkin. His countenance was like marble for whiteness, and his eyes, which were open, beamed supernaturally brilliant. At beholding him, a simultaneous shriek burst from the lips of the people, and there was a terrified backward rush of all who were nighest the cave. Martha, wildly uttering her brother's name, fell forward upon her face insensible. "'Loose him and let him go free,' said Jesus calmly, addressing the petrified and amazed men who had taken away the stone. Mary was the first one who had the firmness to approach him, and as she began removing the napkin from the sides of his face— Others, taking courage by her example, hastened to unswathe his arms and feet. In a few moments he was free from his outer grave clothes, and the healthful color of his cheeks coming to him. His lips flushed brilliantly with red. His eyes looked natural, beaming with wonder and love as he gazed about him. Perceiving Jesus, he was about to cast himself at his feet in gratitude, for he seemed to have consciousness of all that had happened. 
but the mighty prophet drew him to his embrace and kissed him. But my pen refuses to find language to express the unspeakable emotions of joy and gratitude, words of love and praise that filled all hearts. Now the great prophet, now Lazarus, and now Jesus again received the plaudits of the vast throng of people. Hymns were chanted to Jehovah as we passed through the streets, and so many fell down to worship Jesus that it was long before we crossed the threshold of the dwelling, which Jesus did indeed enter with Lazarus by his side. And Martha did see her brother sit at the table, and that night his head rested in deep slumber upon the flower-strewn pillow which her faith and love had prepared for him. With the hope of soon embracing you, I remain as ever, your loving daughter, Adina.